It's amazing when you have unlimited resources at your job, the things you can come up with, which is why I made my own broadheads in this video. And I also tested them out on a bunch of stuff. And I'm gonna take you on the whole journey I've been going on these last couple weeks because I've broken a lot of stuff and learned a bunch of stuff figuring this out. So let's get into it. So let's run this step by step. I want to show you each part of the process because honestly, I think it's pretty cool. So the first thing it's going to do here is face off. Nothing too crazy there. We do that in every single part we run on this channel. So I'm not going to get too into detail on that. But the next thing you'll notice we do is we're going to do some turning. This is to whittle down the material as much as possible, right? This is a lathe. So any turning you can do is always going to be easier than milling. So there might not be any turned parts in the front of this part. But if I could turn this material away like this, it's gonna be a lot easier. Okay, so after it is turned, it's gonna look like this. You're pretty much just gonna have a little cone here. Again, I wanted to turn this down because turning is so much easier on the lathe. So after this, pretty much all we're going to be doing is milling to create the arrowhead shape of the part. My next tool is gonna to be this guy right here. This end mill is gonna come up and it's going to mill like the pyramid shape of the arrowhead. This is what's gonna give it its sharp edges. So let's do that. Now, if you're wondering why we ran this out of brass, well, that's because when you run this machine with stainless in it, you have to run the coolant. And the coolant system in this machine sounds like that the whole time. So for your sanity, I didn't want to make you listen to this the whole time. I decided to run it out of brass and you can also see it. So that's why. Honestly absurd. Like, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but the way it comes out of the turret, like through the holder, it like encapsulates the end mill and gets perfect coolant to it. That is actually a very, very big deal. And I've never seen a machine where the coolant nozzle at the top, like the, the head wall coolant nozzle is that powerful. <laughs> That's actually absurd for oil to be pumping that hard. So yeah. And then also one other thing to show you is the high pressure coolant on this machine is honestly absurd. This whole thing right here, all those pumps, all that is just dedicated to the coolant. So it might sound loud, but it really is just because it has such big pumps and such big mist collectors to make it so it runs better. So it's good. This is normal in a shop to have this kind of noise, but here we, you know, we're making videos. We can't really do that. After it mills the pyramid shape, it's gonna come in and it's gonna do a couple of finished passes. I really wanted those edges to be as sharp and burr free as possible because well, it's supposed to stab things, so you want a nice, clean, sharp edge. Before we go any further, it would be a great time for you to hit that subscribe button. Also hit like. It helps us out a lot. Two, one. Eh. So the next tool that's going to come up is going to utilize a really cool technology. It's called eye machining, right? And I'm going to be honest with you, I find this incredibly mind bending and fascinating at the same time. So watch this tool path, right? And just know that all I did was select the part and I told my software to go ham. I didn't control it or do anything whatsoever. I just told it to go to full max level and it took the tensile strength of my material and figured out all of this tool path right here. Okay, so I'm going to stop it right here. Honestly, words are not good enough to explain how this works to you. So I want to hop over to my computer and show you how this works on my computer because it's truthfully fascinating. So let's take a look at this super simple toolpath. So right over here is my iMachining 3D toolpath. So when I click on that, I can show you the settings and the options are actually really simple. So you just start with your geometry. All I'm going to do here is select my target. My target is my 3D model. Okay, that's all I have to select. Then down here, obviously you tell it a tool. We chose our 3 8 diameter end mill. And then here is our levels. Now this is pretty important because we need to tell it how far to care, right? Like go to this point. So the upper level is going to be zero and the lower level is gonna be minus 1.20249, which is back here at the back of that diameter. All right, all we have to do after that is this. I just give it a setting of eight. We could do seven, six, but you know, it's tightens the CNC, so I'm gonna do level eight. Okay, so with just those few options right there, let's watch our simulation. I want to show you how easy this is, right? I just selected like four things and it's going to do all this for us. 
So once we pop into our machine simulation, we could see the tool path that SolidCam created. Again, if you notice, it will look just like what's happening inside the machine. It's going to use the rotary axis and just stay on center and Y and just rotate around the whole part and rough everything out for us. And that is all it takes to create that tool path. Again, I wanted to show you this because it is this simple. You just select a few things and the machine calculates everything for you. Your step over, your speeds, your feeds, everything. It's honestly wild how well this works and how simple it is. I always do love something that makes my job that much easier. So yeah, that's gonna reduce the weight and help us go through our ballistics dummy here. You know, we'll see how good that works. And uh, yeah, that's that for that. Oh, sorry, hit the camera. We're done. You ready? Three, two, one. Oh. Oh, dude. Good grief. I'm actually shocked that it did not go through, but that is, uh, honestly, I might just leave that arrow in there. That's a pretty cool, like, decoration like that. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So, next up, this is kind of something I ran into later as I was processing this part. You have to realize that the tabs on this part are very, very thin, and they're very, very easy to bend. So, initially, this wasn't in there, but this was something I added later because I was having problems. And that was because in a future process I'm going to show you, we're going to surface mill out the scallop of this part, okay? But once I came in and grooved, like I'm about to behind it, it just absolutely bent the tops of the arrowhead. So this tool right here is to come in and relieve that before I mill any more of the material away to make it so when I groove it later, it doesn't bend. Okay, next up, pretty much whenever I run the Swiss Deco 36 and I can use the B-axis turret, I'm going to because this to me is one of the coolest features on a machine I've ever worked on. And that's this right here if you watch. Turret indexes, wrap it out, and just swings at an angle and allows me to do angled work. I can't get over that. I've probably talked about it in every video we've done with this machine. This isn't me trying to sell anything here. That is an unbelievably cool feature to have. All these little numbers, right, are just tiny little movements, only f fractions of an inch away from each other, tiny little spots in space, less than a thousandth of an inch away from each other that the machine is moving through in space as it progresses up the part. I, it blows my mind that the machine can read this and react in real time like that. I know that that's how every machine works. I just find this technology really, really cool, right? Like if you tried to do this 60, 70 years ago, even 30 years ago, it would be very, very difficult. Machines weren't capable of processing information this fast in real time and making whatever you want like this. I think today we kind of take stuff like that for granted, you know? So yeah, what this is doing right here is, you know, my turret's at an angle like this to the part, all right? And if you look at it this way, you can see this curved shape. And what this is doing is it's slowly working its way up in 3,000 increments to surface this shape and make it look as smooth as possible. All right, so the next thing it's gonna do is it's actually gonna come in with that end mill, the same end mill that we did in an angle. I'm gonna rotate to 90 degrees to finish this little tiny spot right here because I couldn't quite get that with my tool at an angle. So again, B-axis turret being awesome, I can just rotate my tool around and come in and attack this from the front like you would like a five axis milling machine. Really endless possibilities when your turret can rotate like that. Even in turning, being able to turn your tool like that and just do whatever is, it's ridiculous how handy that really is. In this part right here, I want you to like get close because I think this is kind of nuts. Like I know it's gonna work. I know it's gonna work, right? And this next tool, I've seen it run a hundred times, but no matter what, I will always get nervous when I watch a machine do this, all right? So it's gonna finish this. It's gonna wrap it back, rotate index and it's going to come flying towards the main spindle and i swear no matter how many times i watch that it makes me cringe it's ah okay yeah so here is the next tool it's a 3 end mill it's going to pop a hole right here in our part for our other end mills to come in for clearance i always think it's kind of cool too if you look you can see it kind of popping through the bottom uh, it's always cool when you can see your tools from the other side doing their work now this you might be wondering why i'm not going faster well that's because if you look at this from the side or from the front if I drill into this, the drill will hit the part and walk. So I just took a tiny little end mill and did 5,000 pecks and just slowly pecked through. Again, I'm not trying to go fast here. I'm trying to make a good part continuously. And with a part like this, it really isn't about cycle time. It's more about continuously making a good part. So you could drill a hole faster, absolutely. But I need this little 30 second operation to work. So the other 20 minutes will go well. It is so hard to keep these machines like camera ready. Like, there's oil. Everything's oily on a Swiss machine. So, like, 
Titan's always on me about fingerprints. It's like, brother, I promise you I'm trying. I, prom I promise I'm trying. I'm trying my best. Okay, so the majority of the front of the arrow is done. We still have to mill out, we still have to mill out these little windows you see right here. But as you can tell, the whole back end needs to be roughed out. All right, and this is where it gets a little bit dicey. You don't want to bend these little tabs. But what we're going to do here is we're going to groove all that out with our cutoff tool. Now, there was something I was worried about, and that was... 17.4 <laughs> is really stringy, okay? If you come in and just groove all the way down while this is spinning, you're going to create a really long chip. And this right here is super prone to grabbing a chip and just wrapping around the part. If that happens, everything else after that will fail. So you're going to notice here that I'm gonna groove this down in really tiny pecks and increments. And the reason why I did that was because I was worried about chips wrapping around the part. And I would love to show you this on stainless, but it would be really, really stupid to run this dry out of stainless. Like it'd be stupid. Okay, so let's run this in stainless steel with no coolant. I'm really not sure how this will work. Yeah, see? So like I said, what this will do is it will create the shortest possible chip. The way that thing is shaped, it is like super prime for just grabbing that chip and just wrapping it around that part, which will destroy anything that happens after that. I will be honest, the, uh, oh gosh, the uh, smoking chips in oil probably are a fire hazard. Probably should have looked for the fire extinguishers before we started this. If you get really unlucky and your oil catches on fire, it probably won't go out very quickly. Oh, wow, all right. We're not gonna run the next tool without coolant, so. Let's put coolant back on. And uh, yeah, let it go. All right, so coolant's back on and you probably can't hear me anymore, so uh, back to brass. So yeah, if stainless steel just flaked away like brass does, you wouldn't have a lot of the problems that you have to worry about with stainless steel. But you know, it's not a perfect world. It's the biggest problem with cutting most of those aerospace grade stainless steels is that they create long stringy chips. And there's only a few things you can do about that. One of them is pecking. There's other technologies that are out there to fix this problem, but we're not gonna get into that in this video. So for this part, I just did a bunch of tiny little pecks. So I'll let the tool come up. All right, I'll press feed hold. I'll turn my spindle off, open the door. Okay, so next up we are... Wow, dude. Go EDM something, dude. Yeah, thanks. Interrupt my video, whatever. No, no one cares. No one cares about the Swiss content, I swear. But anyways. So the next thing up is this little three millimeter end mill from Horn is going to wrap it into that hole we drilled and it's gonna rough all this out and finish it. And then another tool, a 1 16th inch end mill is going to come in and finish the spot that this tool can't get to because it can't quite get all the way into that tiny little gap. So I want to show you how this is programmed because that might sound like a lot, but it's really one tool pass. So let's go back over to my magical computer and check out how this works because honestly, it's pretty cool. Okay, so for these two windows, again, I wanted to show you this because of how easy it is. All I do is go into my iMachining toolpath here. And I think this is pretty slick, right? So geometry, we just selected that chain and solid cam will make a 2D chain out of that. So I went in here and I selected all these edges and then solid cam created this chain right here, right? So it made that whole chain on one level, right? And then again, it's the same as it was before, except for here, I actually selected two tools. I selected my three millimeter end mill and I selected my 1 16th end mill right there. And what's cool is, again, all I tell it is just to go to eight. Go as fast as you can with the tools in the machine. And it knows in the background right here, 6,000 RPM is my max spindle speed. And with that right there, it creates both those tool paths. So it actually will figure out everything it can do with one end mill and then figure out everything else it has to do with the little end mill. It's extremely easy. So let's see what that looks like. So the nice thing is with this one, we're just gonna go into simulate and we're just gonna go into solid verify. It's not a rotary type tool path, so I don't need to use the full machine simulation. And again, with just those few options, it's gonna figure all this out. So it's gonna rough all that out and get as much as it can with that three millimeter end mill. Okay, and then you're gonna see here with the, with the smaller tool, it's gonna come in and it's just gonna finish this little bit of remaining material right here. And that is why I wanted to show you that because on other softwares you have to separate things, you have to do a whole bunch of work just to be able to pick that pocket and say, hey, do this and do it fast is all I had to do. That is wildly easier 
than other softwares I've used in the past. And again, I really want to reiterate this because it just breaks my mind. I did not program any speeds or feeds here. SolidCam is looking at the tensile strength of 17.4 and figuring out all of this for me. I know I've said that like four times already. It's probably getting old, I'm sorry. It's just really, really impressive to me that it's that simple. I decided to come up with this tool from Horn right here and back turn the part and then thread it on the main. So now everything's done on the main spindle. There's no chance of ripping anything out of a collet. It will work perfectly this way. So yeah, this will come in, turn the first diameter and then turn the thread diameter. I didn't want to do it all in one shot. That was more than what that insert could handle. This back turning insert is from Horn. It's actually pretty cool. They have that centered chip breaking technology. We did a video on it like, I don't know, six months ago where it could break the chip on anything. Worked perfectly on this, just like it did in the video. So if you are doing any back turning on a Swiss machine, I would check out that tool because it works very well. So this right here is probably the most nerve wracking part of the whole process. I hate when I have to do this on machines, but in order to cut this part off, I have to spin it. In order to grab this part, I have to have a non-uniform shape in my collet. So these both have to spin in perfect sync with each other in order to not break it off. And when you watch how fast this machine can do that, it's crazy. Like this is gonna be spinning at 2000 RPM in perfect sync, it's just gonna feed and go perfectly into that collet and cut it off. I think it's nuts, but watch it in real time because it truthfully is insane. The counter spindle goes back home and when you're done, open up your counter spindle and your door and voila got yourself an arrowhead kind of curious though what do you think a brass arrow would do if we shot that at something thank you for making it to the end of the video oh oh <laughs> it didn't even break it what i would have thought for sure that would have worked Of course, the one, the one I miss, I hit everything except for the one we use for an outro, of course. All right, I'm gonna clean all this up. Three, two, one. <laughs> All right, well, obviously this arrowhead won't work twice, so we need to swap it out. But to make sure I don't cut myself, I had Trevor print me this tool to change out the arrowheads on his Mark Forge 3D printer. So we'll unscrew this arrow tip and we'll put on the new one and back to shooting. Two, one, go. <laughs> Three, two, one. Ah. Oh. Did the person watching this subscribe to our YouTube channel? Most likely. Can you see that? So make sure you uh, smash that like button, hit subscribe. Magic 8-Ball says so.